Welcome to the course on plasma physics and applications. In the last lecture, we have derived together a very simple design of a fusion reactor based on the magnetic confinement approach. We have seen that in our minimization of the cost and maximization of the output power, one key parameter was standing out, and that was the wall loading that we can tolerate. That is the maximum power that the plasma facing walls can withstand before being damaged. That's no wonder because, of course, what we're trying to do in a fusion reactor is to trap matter that's hotter than at the surface of the sun into a material object, which is the reactor itself. Today we will explore a little bit this uh, question of the interaction between the plasma and the surrounding walls in the reactor by looking at the requirements of the reactor first wall, by looking at the concepts of limiters and diverters, by defining the scrape of layer and seeing what its characteristics are, by looking at the advantages of the diverter concept and why we actually pursuing that as a possible solution. We will also explore what the plasma facing materials are that are foreseen for ITER and what the challenges are that remain for the diverters to be optimized. And in doing that, we'll illustrate a few ideas on how to go forward and propose innovative diverter configurations. First of all, the reactor first wall has to withstand very large heat fluxes on the material. It has to withstand in the sense that the erosion has to be very limited and there has to be no melting. These pictures give you an idea of uh, what the fusion reactor compares to. We have seen that we have to have about five, say, over the 10 megawatts per square meter in the reactor what object can we compare that to? In the pictures here, we see objects that are normally subject to power fluxes of the order of a megawatt per square meter, so much less than the fusion reactor. That is the case of a fission reactor. That is the case of a large turbine. And that is the case of a spacecraft re-entering the atmosphere. We go to a different uh, kind of order of magnitude, and that's even more difficult than the fusion reactor when we go to the surfaces that are exposed to fluxes of the order of 80 megawatt per square meter when a rocket departs. The reactor first wall has to keep the plasma pure. That is uh, very important for two reasons. If we inject impurity in the plasma volume, we have dilution of the plasma fuels. That is, we replace the ions with which we want to achieve fusion by ions that don't achieve any result for us. And also, if we inject impurities in the plasma, they radiate mainly by line radiation if impurities are not fully ionized, or by Bremsstrahlung radiation. And as we have seen together, the Bremsstrahlung radiation depends on the charge and atomic number of the impurity. So if you look at the curve that shows the minimum ignition temperature as a function of the impurity concentration, we can see that that temperature, which is calculated here just using the Bremsstrahlung as a loss channel, we know that is a, an optimistic uh, view, but even with that, the impurity concentration influences that minimum temperature, of course, making it going up as the concentration goes up. But even more importantly, we notice here that that curve changes dramatically as you go from low Z impurities, this is a case of carbon, to high Z, such as iron and molybdenum. So you have to avoid the injection of impurities in the core, in particular of high Z impurities. The reactor first wall has to also minimize the retention of tritium. Tritium is co-depositive with carbon, if we are in the presence of a carbon-based wall, and stays there. So that's, of course, unacceptable for a fusion reactor. In this uh, pictorial view on the left, we see the mechanism with which the tritium is trapped on the surfaces. And more importantly, on the right-hand side, here we see the retained amount of uh, tritium in a wall as a function of time of plasma, in a sense. This is the case of ITER, maybe represented as functional time for the plasma, or as a function of discharge in ITER taken of a duration of 400 seconds. And what we see here is that we have a level which we cannot overcome, which is 700 grams. That's a level that we can afford having 
of tritium, of course, trapped in the wall of the reactor. We cannot go above that, but actually, if we have an old carbon-based wall, we do go above that, and we do go, go above that quite quickly, only after a few hundreds of its discharges. So that's not possible. So we need to go to the other options here, in particular, if we look at the red stripe here, that indicates the situation in which we have uh, materials that are all uh, tungsten based. And with these materials, we never go above that level, even if we have 25,000 discharges of ether at 400 seconds. So that's a situation that's uh, compatible with the requirements for the inventor of tritium in the plasma walls. So to briefly recap, we have seen that the wall has to withstand large heat fluxes, and of course to exhaust both the fusion produced and the external heating power, it has to keep the plasma pure and it has to minimize the tritium retention. There are other constraints. The walls must minimize the production of dust, which can create very large perturbation at the edge of the plasma and therefore affect the fusion performance. It has to be compatible with providing the containment for vacuum, and it has to be compatible with fueling the plasma, that is injecting the particles that need to be uh, forming the plasma fuels once they are ionized. And finally, it has to also contribute to pumping the helium ashes. This is the helium that has been produced by the fusion reaction. It has given, in the form of alpha particles, of course, its energy to the fuel ions themselves. So this is something that we need to take out once it has given its energy. Currently, there are two possible configurations for the part of the plasma that is close to the wall, what we call the limiter and what we call the diverter. The question is that you have to define very well a specific area of the walls that is in direct contact with the plasma. That area is the one that will have to take the power that's carried by the particles issued from the plasma and that's not being radiated before it arrives to the wall. So the limited configuration is shown on the left. We have a set of, uh, in this case, concentric uh, uh, field lines, they represent the flux surfaces in the plasma, and the outer part of them intercepts a material surface. So this is just, of course, a, a, an abstract representation, but it's superposed on an actual realization of a limiter configuration, which is in the Tor Supra uh, Tokamak in France. The limiter is quite large in this case, so the portion of the plasma that's all the way to the outside actually directly touches this material surface. So the plasma is limited, we say, on that material surface. On the right-hand side, we, we have a picture of jet, which is an example of a tokamak that has a diverter. A diverter is a magnetic configuration that provides a, a null point here for the poloidal field. We call this the X point because, of course, it can be seen as a, an X figure. And by doing that, we have basically a separation between the flux surfaces inside that are not touching any material surface and the lines that go around that are the only ones that actually touch a material surface. So we really have a much clearer separation between confined core and edge of the plasma. The X point, of course, needs to be achieved with specific uh, magnetic uh, coils. In the case of jet, they are inside the vessel. In the case of ITER, they will be outside the vessel. And they have to provide, again, a null point for the poloid field, which is the X point. In this image, we also see um, the light emitted by the plasma when it's run in the configuration of an X point. And you can see that at the bottom here, we have a so-called diverter chamber, which is corresponding to this region, uh, these two regions here on the, on the picture. Let's consider now what we call the scrape off layer, or SOL. This is the outer layer of the plasma that's in direct contact with the material wall. It plays a very important role because it determines the, really the effect of the plasma on the wall itself, and it also has influences on uh, the plasma core behavior in some circumstances. The thickness of the SOL results from a balance between cross-field and parallel dynamics. And we can estimate that for a simple case of a limiter configuration in the circular plasma. So this is the sketch I like to uh, concentrate on. This uh, orange stripe is my scrape of layer. It will uh, touch 
the material surface and that's where the parallel flow will play a, a role in the sense that the flow along the poloidal fin lines will actually impinge on the on the limiter there the thickness of that channel if you like is l sol so my thickness of the so of this scraper layer that i would like to estimate and that has to be compensated and has to be fed in a sense by the perpendicular uh, flux coming from the simple fixed flow, so that's the cross field transport due to the gradient of the density times a diffusion coefficient d. So let me do the uh, simple calculation. So I consider the flux gamma r times the surface over which it takes place, which is 2 pi a 2 pi r0. That has to be equal to 2 times, and the factor of 2 comes from the fact that we're coming from both sides. 2 times NCS L scraper of layer times 2 pi R0, because L scraper of layer times 2 pi R0 is my surface for the calculation of this parallel flow. I'd like to make a couple of comments here. First, I remind you that CS is the ion sound speed. As you have seen in a previous lecture, this is the characteristic speed with which the ions move to a material surface that faces the plasma. They do that under the influence of a nonlinear electrostatic potential structure, which we call the sheath, that the plasma itself develops to maintain quasi-neutrality. Second, I draw your attention to the fact that I have significantly simplified this formula. I say that the plasma is outflowing at a velocity of the order of Cs to the vessel wall. In reality, the plasma is flowing at Cs in a direction along the magnetic field. So in, in the calculation, in principle, one would need to introduce the angle of the magnetic field with respect to the wall, say alpha, and write that the outflow velocity is Cs times the sine of alpha. However, in this estimate of the order of magnitude of the SOL width, we neglect this, taking a value of the sine of alpha over the 1. So I simplify the factors that are identical on the left and on the right, and I write pi AD times the gradient, of the density in the greater direction is equal to NCS times the thickness of the strip of layer. But the gradient in the greater direction can be estimated simply just like the density over the scale length over the density variation um, as LSOL. So the density is assumed to vary over a scale length that corresponds to the thickness of the strip of layer itself. So we can write by A, D, N over L, S, O, L, and that's approximately equal to N, C, S, L, S, O, L. So the density goes away, and we can estimate the thickness of the scrap of layer, which is the square root of by A, D over C, S. We can take typical numbers, for example, for ether with an empirical value for D, the particle diffusion coefficient, typically of the order of one meter square per second, and come up with something of the order of a centimeter. So that's very small. That means we have a very thin layer around the plasma that is in direct contact with the material wall, and that thin layer will carry a lot of power uh, to a very small surface. Let's look specifically at the advantages of the diverted concept, which is the concept that we are now following and using for all present and future devices we have in mind. First of all, there's a very long connection length parallel to B, and that is the length, the effective length of the field lines that the particles uh, see as they approach the X point. So if we represent the X point as we have done before in a 2D configuration, that's a polyoidal cut, I need to try and draw the 3D field lines that correspond to that. The field lines will start to go around and around and around for a long distance because, uh, because of the uh, toroidal field before they can actually reach the target. So for ether, for example, that length is about 150 meters. The fact that it's so long gives us, in a sense, a lot of time to reduce the power of power flux, flux that arrives to the target. It also enables me to have gradient of temperature in a parallel direction. So if I go down this way, 
say, and I plot, say, the temperature in this axis. The temperature will not be uniform, but it actually will go down. So that means as I approach the target plates, I can have a colder and colder plasma. And I will be able, in a well-designed configuration, to have pretty low temperature in the diverter chamber of the order of only a few EVs, although I have thermonuclear temperatures in, in the core of the plasma and much higher temperature, of course, upstream of that. Following up on the advantage of the diverted concept, because we're able to reduce the temperature, we're also able to reduce the erosion and the purity production by a number of effects, including the physical sputtering by the ions, so the fact that the ions impinge on the surface with their energy and extract atoms from the surface. We can also reduce the chemical sputtering by the ions. The ions that impinging on the surface can create chemical composites. And we can also reduce the neutral impact, that is the number of charge exchange collisions, um, with this reduced temperature. The configuration will enable, will enable us also to reduce the transfer of impurities back to the main chamber. That is a key element in the need for a plasma to be maintained pure. It has also been noticed experimentally that in the presence of an X point, that is in the presence of a diverter configuration, it's easier to access what we call high confinement regimes. These are regimes in which at the edge of the plasma we notice that the turbulence decreases and therefore the confinement improves. The decrease of the turbulence is represented here in the sequence of images taken at the very edge of the plasma in which you see that in some circumstances there are bubbles, sometimes we refer to them as blobs, that take uh, particles and energies out quite effectively, but in the present of X point we can create what's called a transport barrier, that is a region of very quiescent plasma that in, in fact makes it very difficult to particles and energy to go across it. The profiles that result are significantly improved in the sense of fusion, let me just draw them in a completely qualitative way. This is a situation in which we have what we call the L mode, so still a turbulent edge. And if I have a, a situation in which I manage to create a diverter configuration and to create this transfer barrier, which again is possible and actually easy, relatively easy in the presence of a diverter configuration, then I jump up in my profile. I have a very steep gradients and I have a much higher value of pressure. This is a profile of uh, pressure and that's so-called H mode for high confinement mode as opposed to L mode for low confinement mode that we have seen before. And still uh, in both cases we had um, the pressure represented as a function of the real direction. So diverter configuration makes it easier to access to high confinement regime which make us gain significantly performance in the plasma in the, te in the sense of fusion power that can be produced. The diverter creates a region of relatively large pressure and that makes it easy or easier for the pumps to function in that region and therefore to exhaust the particles that need to be taken out of the plasma volume. I can also install cryo pumps around the diverter chamber and extract these particles effectively on the other side of the diverter target plates. This is the design of the ITER diverter and the ITER uh, specific uh, setup for cryo pumping. So diverter allows plasma to be cold close to the walls in that specific uh, area. And if the plasma is cold, say it's uh, of the order of a few EVs in terms of temperature, say 5 AV, that means that the ionization cross-section becomes smaller than the charge exchange cross-section, which makes it uh, easy for energy to be transferred from ions to neutrals. And the neutrals help a lot because they spread the power of the position, forming what we call a neutral cushion. That reduces further the temperature of the plasma in the divertent chamber and the, the recombination between electron and ions can happen over an entire volume that is close to the target but not on the surface necessarily. That reduces the flux 
of energy to the target even further because most of the power will therefore be dissipated by radiation before the plasma reaches the target. So this plasma detachment is a situation in which we would like really to be for it and for the fusion reactors because that's where we limit the power that directly goes to the target as we radiate it before the plasma arrives to the target. And that radiation is visualized in this image and that is really concentrated around the X point in our diverter configuration. And sort of to give numbers um, to uh, this uh, power balance, here I take the case of ITER. As we said, we like to exhaust effectively heating uh, power and particles. And in this case, there's a lot of uh, heat exhaust that takes place via radiation. So say I inject 150 megawatt, both from alpha particle heating and from auxiliary heating from outside. Of course, we're not at ignition, so we still have uh, some external heating of the plasma. And in a typical heater case that we foresee, we radiate from the core about 50 megawatts of those 150. And in a diverter, if we manage to detach it, we will radiate, say, about 70 megawatts of the remaining 100, and only about 30 megawatts will go directly to the wall. So if we have about three, four square meters of plasma wall area that can be, as we call it, wetted by that power, that means that the power uh, to the wall will be giving a flux that will be no more than 10 megawatt per square meter. So we are really in a region that can be managed. If we don't radiate this amount, if we don't radiate this 60 or 70 megawatt, in a diverter on a scraper flare, well, we will exceed this amount and uh, therefore we will damage the diverter target plates very, very uh, quickly. So let me briefly discuss the choice of the materials for the first wall for ITER. This choice now is definitive. The ITER diverter will be entirely made, uh, be made of tungsten. Tungsten is high Z material, but it has a high threshold for sputtering, so only very, very, very small amounts will be actually injected into the plasma core. And uh, it has a big advantage of having very low tritium retention. So that's the, the, the material for the diverter. The rest of the walls, all the walls outside, the diverter chamber, will be made of beryllium. Beryllium is a metal with very uh, relatively low Z. So even if uh, some atoms are injected into the plasma core, they radiate much less than uh, tungsten and dilute the plasma much less as well. It also has a relatively low tritium retention. And in addition, it's a very good oxygen getter to pump the remaining oxygen from the chamber. This combination of materials is chosen also to minimize the deterioration of the thermal mechanical properties under the radiation of the uh, fusion-generated neutrons. So all of this seems to work well. Nevertheless, there are challenges that we're still facing for the diverters, in particular in view of ITER and of the other following burning plasma experiments and demonstration reactors. And perhaps the most important element to discuss is that of transients. These are events that are so-called off-normal, so that are coming on top of the steady state uh, load to the wall. First uh, are what we call the edge localized modes or ELMs. These are instabilities that are generated by the very large edge gradients which we obtain in the high confinement regime. This is a picture of a pressure profile. You can see that at the edge you have a very steep gradient. Very steep gradient is equivalent to very large thermodynamic potential for driving instabilities and this instability will happen and happen in a very short time scale, generating violent bursts of energy and particles to the wall. That is large thermal loads. And if we extrapolate what we know of ELMS today to ITER, we expect something like a 15 megajoule of energy expelled in a single event. In an event that lasts a fraction of a millisecond, and that is going to wet an area of uh, a few square meters. So that is an enormous amount of uh, power per square meter, about 10 gigawatt per square meter. And even if you evaluate uh, 
materials like tungsten, the surface temperature will go up very significantly to about 6,000 degrees over a layer that's not infinitely uh, thin but is about uh, 0 0.1, 0 0.2 millimeters, that means the metals will melt. So this is something we, of course, must avoid. A second uh, example of these uh, transient events uh, is what we call a disruption. A disruption is a sudden loss of plasma control that leads to the plasma being terminated over a very short time scale and uh, sort of impinging on the wall. And that generates a very large deposition of energy on the walls, of course. The image here is a thermographic image of uh, the jet vessel during a disruption, and you can see that uh, there are specific uh, areas inside the vessel that are made very hot by the energy deposited by the disruption. And you can also see an image here that uh, visualizes the consequences that disruption can have. This is the melting of a very thick piece of Inconel, which is a very uh, resistant special steel. In ITER, we anticipate the disruption can lead to peak energy densities in a diverter region of 5 to 20 megajoule per square meter over short time scales, again, 1 to 3 milliseconds. And if we have these, the lifetime of the diverter will be exceeded in a few hundreds of these disruptions. So we must avoid having these events. We simulate in a plasma devices that are simpler than tokamaks, what happens to materials that are facing this kind of thermal loads from plasma. This is an example from the QSPA facility in which the uh, tungsten was exposed to about 100 plasma pulses that are simulating elms of uh, one and a half megajoule per square meter. You can see, of course, very clearly the damage that this tungsten um, feels and it, this tungsten uh, has to uh, withstand that in fact we don't have materials that can last for a sufficiently long time under these thermal loads so that means that from the materials that we need to evolve but we also need to evolve in our capability of avoiding these transit or mitigating the effects of them I'd like to conclude the discussion by just uh, highlighting briefly there are also no ideas as far as the configuration of the diverter. The ideas that are explored not for ITER, which is already designed, but for the steps beyond ITER, in particular for DEMO, which is a step that will demonstrate the economic feasibility of fusion, not just the scientific and technological feasibility. The requirements for the diverter of ITER and for the plasma wall interaction of ITER in general are, of course, valid and even stronger for the steps following ITER. Again, we have to limit the material erosion, we have to increase the radiative power as much as we can, that means we have to have a detached plasma, and we have to maintain the plasma core very pure. In order to do that in more and more uh, stringent uh, situations, such as that of a, a demo reactor, we are exploring essentially uh, three possibilities, or three uh, kinds of possibilities. We may have a liquid metal wall, so there will be a a thin layer of a uh, wall that uh, will uh, circulate around the plasma, for example, lithium, that will take away particles and, and heat. Or we can have uh, special uh, magnetic configurations that are issued from the conventional diverter configuration we have uh, explored together in this lecture. One is the so-called Super X. A picture of, of, of it is here. This is the design for the must upgrade uh, facility in Cullum, UK. SuperX uh, consists of a, an expansion of the diverter uh, target chamber in a sense, so it's a clever way of designing the detail of the uh, diverter chamber so that, in fact, one of the legs of the diverter is effectively uh, not only longer but also of much higher uh, volume. And much higher volume means that you can radiate more easily the power before the plasma reaches the target. Another option is so-called snowflake which we have pioneered in the Lausanne on the Tokamak TCV, where it was first demonstrated. The snowflake is a perhaps even simpler idea. So the diverter, instead of having a two legs that carry the power um, away from uh, the, the core, it has uh, four legs, 
which means that you have more possibilities for uh, plasma exhaust. You also have a, a longer connection length and the region um, around the X point, which is more complex and it may radiate more. It may also lead to a different uh, stability uh, property for the plasma with respect particular to the edge uh, um, violet instability we have seen before. So these are concepts that are being explored. It's not clear that there will be advantages over what we know today, uh, which I can refer to as a conventional diverter, but we need to explore these because the challenges we have uh, seen together are really very, very demanding for the future devices. To summarize, we have seen that the reactor first wall must satisfy a number of very stringent requirements. We have seen that the diverter concept is the one adopted commonly because it has several advantages over the limited concept. New diverter configurations and innovative schemes for constructing a diverter are being explored, in particular for the steps beyond ITER, that is demo and the reactors. The plasma wall interaction is the result of a, of a very intricate combination of plasma physics, atomic physics, and materials physics. The next module, we will look, in fact, at some aspects of these materials physics and the issues associated with the functional and structural materials for reactors.